I recently learned saying good morning is actually inappropriate <clears throat> uh, today. I also apologize, my voice is a little hoarse. Um, it's what happens at conferences, you yell so people can hear you. And so the lozenges are they're starting to work, so I apologize in advance for that. So today we're gonna be talking about snooping on cellular gateways, but first I'm curious, how many people are knowledgeable that we have hydrogen cars? Hydrogen cars driving around the country, driving around Europe. That's random, but I'm just curious. It's did a poll I'm running. <clears throat> so my name is Justin Shattuck. I work for F5 Labs within F5 Networks. We essentially are a voice of security for F5 Networks as a whole. Uh, prior to coming to F5 Labs, I actually was uh, the manager of services engineering. We built the Silverline DDoS scrubbing service and web application firewall for F5 Silverline. Prior to that, I've been essentially a product for a developer for product security or security products for about the 15 years. Um, and I also help uh, co-author with Sarah Bodhi, or Sarah Bodhi, the Hunt for IoT reports. We're now approaching our fifth volume. So today we're gonna talk about essentially how we discovered um, some cellular gateways uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, what we did, we scanned them, which you could expect, the research we performed, why it's important, why, why we're here talking about it today, and some conclusions. So as any good security story starts, it was an interrupted vacation. You can tell I'm still a little bitter and never got to finish my West Veteran. So on October 22nd of 2016, everybody's probably familiar with on October 21st of 2016, we had the Dyn DNS attack. I was in Belgium, so it was October 22nd. It's the reason why the date seems a little skewy. <clears throat> so originally I was investigating or following up on an incident related to Bashlight. Uh, that's what I was expecting to see a DVR. And it was implanted essentially in a very large airport in Europe. Turns out it wasn't a DVR at all. So upon investigating the incident, looking into Bashlight, expecting to just find Bashlight and have another very boring day on October 22nd, turns out, <clears throat> uh, bleh, uh, it was a digital signage solution, actually. This is a very small part of the story, but it's very important. It was the arrivals and departures, departures sign solution in front of this very large airport. This is very important. So we did a very quick disclosure. Call legal, I'm in Belgium, West Coast. Call legal, get advice from legal, think about it, hang up phone, call party responsible for host, ended up having 39 actors um, on the host, and they very quickly unracked the box, I apologize, unracked the box, uh, pulled the drives and shipped them to us, which is amazing. I didn't ask for them, they just volunteered them. So we got to analyze those log files and we ended up finding uh, numerous shell shock attempts, which was just pretty boring as well, um, overall, but we found a bunch of new ver variants of Mirai. And so really, this research is more about how we fell in, or how I fell into this research. So it essentially was observing these packets being flung around the internet at whatever rates were coming out of these devices. We're all familiar with that, so what do you do? You scan, you scan, you scan, you scan, you find the results very interesting. And so, we, researchers, we'd like to rinse and repeat. This is with permission, luckily, uh, fortunately, you got to scan a lot. And so while inside this airport's network, we ended up finding 39 other threat actors, uh, numerous services and hosts are managed by a third party, were in fact managed by the airport at all. And then ultimately we identified uh, what we believed to be a Sierra wireless gateway. And so scanning this network, we stumbled upon the Sierra wireless gateway. And if you're not, if you're not familiar with a cellular gateway, which I'm sure everybody in this room is, but my father isn't, and he may watch, I'm gonna explain it. So you have these little boxes, little black, blue, red, orange, whatever color you might want typically have four, two ethernet ports. Uh, the ones we're specifically talking about have digital IO, analog IO, serial, uh, 802.11x, uh, usually two SIMs, so you have primary and backup for cellular interfaces. Um, numerous other options, I mean, there's a plethora of options. The point is, it's almost endless what you can connect these devices to. And so if you think about that, think about it. You can plug them into nearly anything. You might be able to see where we're going with this. So we started scanning. Originally we searched Shodan, and what Shodan allowed us to essentially do is get a preview of what we could expect to find. So we started putting filters into Shodan, discovered uh, where the Shodan results were, which was about 26,000 for just Verizon, and then we ended up using a data partner that we have for data uh, called Lorica, and so we pulled in some scan data that Lorica was running for us, and from there we were able to actually identify far more devices. There's quite a large difference in the devices that we were able to identify back in 2016 versus 2018, um, and essentially versus Shodan. So what you're looking at is essentially the original set of devices that we found, 
uh, back in 2016. The majority of them are all sitting on Verizon. Uh, there's actually a slash nine uh, that about 30%, I believe, of the Verizon modules or the Verizon radios are actually sitting on. So we broke it down by model. This is a no effort to pick on Sierra. Um, however, we are uh, listed only Sierra models. They have the LS300, the GX400, the 440s, 450s. And what it is is we broke it down, essentially we discovered that the price points like the LS300 uh, is one of their more affordable options. And so of course we're gonna see more of them. It's also older, it's been out longer. Uh, all the way through the newer enterprise edition stuff, like the 450s, the RV50s, there's less of them because there's less of them deployed. People typically want to go to the more affordable options. <clears throat> so this is a preview of what the scan data looked like as we focused on just the United States in 2016. So essentially, you have a dot um, everywhere we found uh, Sierra, Sierra wireless device. Now, the reality is this is not the geolocation of the device. Of course, it's the geolocation of the IP when we looked it up. Um, but it's still relevant. And then the device distribution, fast forwarding into 2018. We have 86,237 devices we've identified in the US alone. 84% uh, of all the devices we found have been found present in the United States. So we focus heavily on the United States, mostly because we understand the infrastructure. We understand the laws, the rules, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, and essentially how we can go about doing it. So on July 30th, we essentially ran another scan right before coming to Black Hat, or pulled the data from our scans to see what, how has it changed since the last time we looked two days prior. And this is actually representative of 105,000, just over 105,000 devices uh, globally. <clears throat> The original, to jump back to 2016, it wasn't a surprise whenever we found the Bashlight incident, and it really wasn't a surprise when we found Mirai on the Sierra wireless device, because Sierra actually released multiple disclosures related to uh, both their enterprise models, their consumer line models, so the GX, EX, LS series, uh, back on October 4th and October 5th. Um, happy birthday to me then. They actually released it on my birthday. So beyond that, we have uh, from the US CERT, they also issue a warning, which is very important at the bottom, but that was issued on October 12th. And the US CERT actually informed us then that there's no actual hardware or software vulnerability that is needed to be used uh, to essentially use these devices for bad. Just summarizing what the CERT told us. And so we learned some lessons. With cellular, you burn some bandwidth. Um, initially, we focused only on the United States. We're fast forwarding now into 2018. In 2018, the scan results, if you, on the numbers that you see for 2018, there's a big difference in 50,000 and 105,000. So you think, oh man, the problem's getting worse, it's doubled, this is horrible. It actually isn't necessarily worse, it isn't actually necessarily double. The numbers are double, but really we got more precise with the way that we were scanning. Instead of just scanning, looking at telnet banners and say port 9191, looking at what we could find over HTTP or HTTPS, we actually started analyzing more, looking at assets like banner images and copyright years and SSL certificates. So we got more and more clever about how we could find these resources. And then we even went beyond that. Unfortunately, we don't have enough room in the deck to fit it all in. Plus my PowerPoint skills are really weak. So you're not gonna find any year over year, um, no moving averages, nothing fancy, unfortunately, in these charts. <clears throat> the next step is we set up a lab. Now the lab setup was in July and August of 2017. We had the devices since 2016. The problem is once the devices were already known to spew packets and we were kind of bored, we, we set it down and we really weren't sure what we were going to be doing at that time. So literally just kind of left the scanners running, left all the data pipeline up and running and then kind of walked away and just didn't really forget about it but was like, okay, what, what else can we do? What else is going to happen? Apologies. <clears throat> so we really weren't sure what what to expect. And in July, I remember we, we noticed something. We noticed essentially a, a data point change. And I, I don't wanna spoil my own talk, but the, the data point essentially changed, so we pick it back up and we begin researching it. <clears throat> so we set up a lab. We grabbed three, three models, which are essentially representative of the three different lines that Sierra offers. And so we kept those in scope. That's what we were focused on. We also discovered uh, Digi devices, uh, which we have up there as well. They are also vulnerable to weak authentication, username, password. And then there's the Moxa device, the G3XXX series, which is actually really funny because it's kind of more of a no-scope. Requires no authentication. So literally, 
If you're a gamer, you might get that joke. No scope it. <clears throat> Here's the important part. Exploiting the vulnerability. I'm sure many of you came in thinking that you were going to find CVEs, exploits, or some sort of POC code that's gonna, I don't know, help you own some gateways. There's no exploit needed. There's no vulnerability to exploit. There's no CVE we're actually tacking onto and taking advantage of to make this possible. We're literally just knowing that the username is user and the de default password is five asterisks. But it's not five asterisks, it's a numeric sequence. It starts with a one, hint, it ends in a five. <clears throat> so you don't need to brute force. Um, <laughs> No need to find any innocent civilians to tap in usernames and passwords to manually brute force Sierra devices. You also notice there's a WAN IP, that's a really bad inside joke. Um, the public GPS coordinates that you see at the bottom, in the bottom of the unauthenticated screen, you'll notice we're not logged in. I also don't own that IP. <clears throat> to give you an idea, these are those coordinates and our great friend Google Maps. Thank you Google, source credit Google Maps. <clears throat> So we actually were able to locate this. You can see that it has satellite fixes. There's 10 of them. We have the latitude and the longitude. And then there's actually, by using the cell ID uh, and the lack, I'm ahead of myself. <clears throat> so I apologize. Visualizing this, moving, for <laughs> moving forward. I talk to myself. If you haven't noticed, I'll talk to myself this whole thing. I'm like a squirrel. I like the sh shiny objects. You know, the stare at three people is really hard when you're staring at four lights. So, the lab testing. In the top left corner, there's the unauthenticated screen. Bottom left corner is the very difficult concept of clicking admin, change password, changing the password. On the right hand side, you get to see a status screen. Now, I don't mean to blaze through that all fast because it's unimportant. It's quite, it's a little bit sarcastic, but it's very serious as well. It has to be a very difficult problem if so many devices are still online and still vulnerable using default credentials. With static IPv IPv4 addresses, on known cellular networks. Think of all the cellular networks you know. We listed 10 of them. Verizon, AT&T, Rogers, Tilius, Bell Mobility, Sprint PCS. <clears throat> Next we have the logging configuration, which by default, the devices ship error only on all categories, except for WAN slash cellular. So what ends up happening is the logs, when you actually log in, no log is emitted. You change the set, you change the setting, no logs emitted. Change the password, no logs emitted. Update any configuration we can find, it emits no logs. There's no log messages because they're all set to error only by default. <clears throat> Next, the only thing that we can find that it actually does successfully emit log messages for that seems very, very important is whenever it gets a new satellite fix. We have a satellite fix from nine to 10. Or we do a satellite fix from five to six or three. It does emit logs for signal gain and signal loss, but nothing for admin, services, VPN, none of the tunnel information, uh, none of the services or reporting or events that it's actually performing while you're connected to it. There's no logging whatsoever that's being emitted. It's a very real problem. Think about everything you, know, you essentially could do if you log into a device with default credentials and you make changes to devices that are sitting on the edge and I remind you can be connected to anything. If you have something that can speak, I don't know, I, well not, I don't know, but IP on like a traditional switched packet network, you can plug, plug device in, network, I don't know, plug your Raspberry Pi into USB and you can route through it that way. You know, don't even use Ethernet on your, on your Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> it's very important. So what we ended up doing is we enumerated through all of our lab hosts using default credentials and started downloading their templates. And I apologize, but on the last side, one thing that I didn't mention to you is you can download these configuration files. These configs are formed in XML. We're all quite familiar with XML. I know I'm really familiar with XML because I work for F5, so I use very large XML configuration files. And so you have the option of including passwords and also including device information. The problem with including the passwords, you might think that they're salted or in some way hashed. They're not, they're plain text. Radius, TACX, uh, WPA2, IPSec, all of your VPN tunnels, everything that you can find is also stored in plain text. So the important bit now to go on to the idea of crawling devices. So we executed this in our lab, we crawled our three devices and we downloaded their configuration files. And from there we started to parse them out for strings. 
And we looked at the manual and we thought, oh, there's some really neat information in here. We can start to tie things to model numbers and firmware versions and actual chip up, you know, chip sets within the devices of Sierra's devices themselves. And then we wrote a parser so we could kind of do it a little bit faster. So we started rapidly making changes. You could reprogram them over the air and nobody would ever know because they don't log. So we essentially muck with each other. We would change configurations and crawl, parse, make configuration changes, crawl, parse over and over again. And we could never essentially find ourselves making our own changes. <clears throat> From there, once we had our lab up, we actually started to notice something that was really, really bizarre. The data point that I was telling you about we started to change. Oh, I'm just not going to spoil it just yet. So we had the Dyn DNS attack. From there, we had the Sierra wireless device that we discovered. We began some research from our scanning. We set up a lab. <clears throat> and the pattern that we identified is because of that public display of latitude and longitude, we were actually start to see the devices were coming online and offline. And they're going offline at regular or seemingly regular times. They come online, say, 8 a.m., plus or minus 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> they go offline, 5, 6, 7 p.m., plus or minus 10 minutes. And they'd have normal break schedules and, and stops in between. And mind you, this is public display latitude and longitudes. Seems pretty innocuous now. But looking at the devices these could be connected to, it gets a little different. So, example, Dr. Seuss says it best. I stole this from a poster on my son's wall. All oh, the places you shall go, and everyone can see them. It's very scary, actually. The lack in the cell ID that you can see on this slide, accompanying the latitude and longitude, if you're unfamiliar, it gives us the location area code, as well as some information about the tower and the antenna that it's talking to. And so from there, we've identified that we're pretty sure we have some shifts. So we started to essentially scrape more and more information off login pages, and from there, try to determine uh, a hypothesis. So we had this pretty good hypothesis of what we thought we were dealing with. We had an idea that we were dealing with devices that had the ability to be mobile. Maybe that's people. You know, if you remember the story in Austin, Texas, it's South by Southwest. You know, there's like roaming hotspots that are people. Maybe these people have Sierras on their backs. We don't know. So we go to sierrawireless.com. We start evaluating their case studies. And the unfortunate bit about all marketing departments and the way that we publish our use cases, uh, F5 include, it's a wealth of information when you're starting to do research and what you're trying to find out about who's using what, when, and where. And so we actually took it, this thing is very sensitive in my hand. <clears throat> we, we took the liberty of identifying what customers we could uh, that they've spoke about. We didn't go as far as looking at tweets and really deep into blog posts. But we wanted to get a general idea of what we could find out from Sierra what they had to say essentially about their customers, their partners, and who's using these devices. So we built a map. <clears throat> Come on, it's a pretty map. I mean, let's be real. They got a lot, a, lot, a lot of blue dots. So the blue dots represent the top 300 most populated cities in the country. And then from there, we overlaid it with the data that we got from Sierra, which are the little you know, orange dots. There's not as many orange dots as blue dots. It doesn't mean that the problem isn't big. It doesn't mean that it's not real. The red outlines represent that uh, in the state of Mississippi, the entire state for the Highway Transportation Safety Board, I believe it is, uh, uses them statewide. In California, the California Highway Patrol uses them statewide. That's why we have those highlighted in red. Now the orange, you look, you have Houston and Austin and Seattle, uh, down in LA, Southern California, very major metropolitan areas, and which we now know not only from our own work, but we know from our work through what Sierra is delivering to us via their website, who these customers could be. It helps us kind of prove out this hypothesis, which we find very encouraging in 2017, so we push forward. We have now identified that we are dealing with fleets of vehicles. So we took all of this information that we've been scraping, the latitude and the longitudes, the cell information, everything that we could get that we could essentially be provided without having to authenticate against a device. From there, we started plugging it into a system called TrackCar. And TrackCar actually can support multiple formats. You can use TIP data, which Sierra supports, NEMA, and other GPS formats. And those devices will, you can set up five profiles at most, and then we'll ship that GPS data to you under a, numerous, under a number of circumstances. One being distance traveled, speed traveled. You can create triggers. This vehicle moves at more than 55 miles an hour in, I don't know, six seconds, right? Let's, a quarter mile in under eight seconds. We're finding drag racers or something. Let's go ahead and trigger. That would be the idea behind it. <clears throat> now, the reality is there's that 
If you don't move more than 200 meters, send a message. If it's been 30 seconds, send a message. Start to get this data. So on the right, we have everything that we collected from public latitude and longitudes. And then on the left, we have something very interesting. When we identified these fleet vehicles, we started to notice a pattern. And this pattern included, for example, you can participate. You have a vehicle that arrives at a donut shop, a Dunkin' Donuts. It stays there for eight minutes. It then takes a 26-minute drive north to what now is a sheriff's station. From that sheriff's station, it then goes and works what we believe to be a beat. From that beat, it goes home. This visualization is representing a number of police officers in a metropolitan area that were able to be tracked live using public latitude and longitude data. I'm shaking, like, and I'm not nervous. We are tracking police. We are tracking police officers. This has moved far beyond the internet. I make this joke, and I mean it quite seriously. It's moving beyond the internet of things, and we are becoming the things of the internet. This affects all of us in ways that you can own. We have only put it in movies. You can, we've, we've now identified not only police officers, fire, medical, traffic cameras, <clears throat> traffic lights, the list goes on. You can essentially reroute traffic. You can reroute data. Uh, the Sierra wireless devices allow you to change the DNS servers. You can imagine the main and the middle possibilities that we can do with DNS. We can listen, we can take them offline. And worst is you cannot disable these. Right? As a vigilante, if you're a vigilante, please don't do this. Don't go in and shut these down. You're taking off critical systems, critical infrastructure for us. And we're the critical infrastructure in this story. It's our lives. We are the people, the critical infrastructure in all of this. Yeah, I'm not saying that power meters and pumping stations and airplanes and cars and police officers are not important. They're very critical to our lives. But in my world, in my mind, we're very critical to this story. This isn't necessarily a story about just owning devices. It's, it's us. It affects our lives. And so I just, I don't know. You get it. No? All right. We have hydrogen cars. The way we know we have hydrogen cars, the way I learned we have hydrogen cars is we found hydrogen refueling stations. Lots of them in North America, actually. So there was this idea. Sometimes when you're doing research over the course of 22 months, you start to get a little antsy. And so I had this idea one night and thought, okay, if weak authentication can get me at the perimeter, what's behind it? So essentially took a peek. Weak authentication not only can get you into the perimeter, but weak authentication got us into, excuse me, got me into services uh, essentially behind the scenes. Surveillance system, point of cell system. I was told that should not have surprised me, but I'll be honest, it actually did. Um, I was quite surprised to know that the services sitting behind this also uh, were affected by weak authentication, frankly, because we know that third parties often install these Sierra devices and then essentially walk away. I've heard numerous stories about third parties configuring these and then essentially walking away and the companies that are paying for them learn about it whenever they've been given a bill, they've sent 2,600 spam text messages. People you know, own the devices that send spam. Don't even talk about that really in this talk, but I guess I just added it. There's a lot of other activities you can do with these other than what we list. But we found the hydrogen cars and that was very important. It was three days after we started the research and so again, come back in time with me. October 25th of 2016, we sent over 400 disclosures. We got zero responses in three days. Three days wasn't a big deal. But the reason why we put the research down and had to kind of set it aside is without people responding, without people actually taking an interest in the fact that we're warning them, that their networks are available, that we could identify all of these devices that are on their networks, part of their networks, gateways into their networks, doorways that allow people in very, very easily, we received no responses. It's very discouraging. It's actually heartbreaking because the list is very big. It includes probably a lot of you in this room. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but it probably does. And so we came upon these worst case scenarios and all of this time that we had to be antsy and think about it. And so it allowed us to know where all of the law enforcement officers are at any time. Now I'm trying to say this in a scary voice, but my voice is hoarse, so I can't get the oomph to really get it out there and make it scary for you. But the reality is as more and more communications are moving to more encrypted channels for all of these officers and all of these municipalities, who cares? We have GPS. Why be accurate to 
a beat, a zip code, a city, or you could be accurate to meters or feet, or depending on the device, less than feet. The very accurate devices based on the radio they put on top. Additionally, you have back in 2016 going into 2017, there was over 150% rise in, and I always kind of get this wrong, but I believe they're called like ambush style killings. There were these assassination attempts against law enforcement officers. And so naturally this, this scenario stuck out to us. This was very important back when we were doing this research. We were finding these topics in the news and we know we're watching police officers. So you can imagine the kind of the goosebumps that go up, up your spine or at least mine. And so we have GPS logging, and so we really thought, and I didn't speak to this earlier, but we started monitoring the behavioral profile of each device. And we were able to identify which ones are essentially people in vehicles, or people in buildings, or people driving through tolls, people watching tolls, bridges, billboards, etc. Follow-on attacks. We all see in the news, and this is very real, as you have EMS emergency medical services show up to a crime, to a scene, what ends up happening is they control ingress and egress. They have the ability to know who's coming, how they're coming, where they're coming from. You can see these devices. These devices, aka people, ambulances, fire, police officers. And so you essentially are giving away, we're giving information that allows, and we, we take this very seriously in our research on the terrorism side, you actually are providing an ability for nation state actors to use this information or not nation state actors, very vile, horrible people, to do very bad things on, as follow-up attacks. I wish I was better at scaring you. Like, I could have brought a mask. I don't know. But these guys are all like, ooh, and you guys are all like, hmm. So, we have yet to find an industry that this doesn't touch. Uh, cellular adoption rates from 2G to 4G LTE have been on the rise since 2014. 2G is still the predominant winner. There's a lot of 2G devices still out there. But 4G is, is coming, and we all know about 5G. This problem gets worse and worse with 5G. It becomes way worse in 5G. And so we have an opportunity now. If you're an underwater basket beaver, basket weaver, don't worry about it. You're cool. You're not going to have cellular down there. But if you're not, if you're any other industry, any other, any other industry that needs to be connected, constant connectivity, you're likely going to use cellular. And as we keep making advances in cellular technology, we're going to continue finding problems. This problem has existed at least in, since 2012. And so here we are, 2018. And you might be wondering, why did you wait so long to talk about it? Discouragement. 13,000 disclosures, more than 13,000 disclosures sent over 22 months. We've had two responses. Two. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. It's actually, it's still heartbreaking. But there's one very good silver lining in it. We have a dialogue that we were able to start with Sierra Wireless. When Black Hat tweeted that we were doing this talk, when Black Hat put it up on the site, we, people started to listen a little more. So we have a little bit more attention. And so we've been able to work with Sierra and actually I didn't you know, clarify numbers, clarify ways that we're finding things and validate it. And what's wonderful is they've, they've essentially agreed with us. They, they know far better than I'm sure we do, but we've been able to collaborate and actually determine how many devices there are and what we can do to solve this problem. And so what ends up happening is <clears throat> we gotta fix it. Seth Green, and I'm sorry for not remembering your name, these two gentlemen essentially on the slide to remind us of the Italian job. It's really funny as I think through this entire amount of research how many Italian job references there could be. You have Seth Green at the end, right? He's sitting on that airport, a little baggage claim. He's on his fake brown keys and, and essentially manipulating the flow of traffic through a city. So this bank heist or gold heist from Edward Norton uh, whatever his name is, can you know they can steal his money, and they were quite successful. That's not Hollywood fiction anymore, right? It's very real. Again, we found traffic cameras, traffic lights. These devices sit in the middle. What can we do about it? We all have friends. We all know colleagues. We all have peers. Reach out to your peers. They run these devices. Scan the networks. Essentially, change the password immediately. That's step one. If you go to any of the advisories that Sierra has released, change the password. 
And essentially, upgrade the firmware. If you don't want to be vulnerable to the insecure firmware updater that got Mariah on the boxes to begin with, and then as well as Reaper in April of this year, they released another advisory, then upgrade the firmware. Third, configure the management interface. If you're gonna leave the default password, at least use trusted IPs, whitelist the IPs, put an ACL, put an access control list on the actual device, on the management interface you plan on using to be silly. You can be a little bit better, you can be a little bit more silly then. But if we find you, we'll still call you out. And second of all, <clears throat> just don't use Telnet. Use SSH, right? Move from Telnet to SSH, get off default ports, don't use standard certificates, change passwords, configure the logging to give you something more than just whenever you get 10 satellites instead of nine satellites, because I'm sure that doesn't actually matter to you. If you do have to display information like public latitude and longitude and cell information, you absolutely need to make sure you block that off from the public and, you know, using ACLs to restrict the access. At least use a VPN tunnel. <clears throat> I hope I did not blaze through this too incredibly fast, but one thing I've learned is there's usually a lot of questions of, as I've uh, started to tell this story over time. And I think with that, I am Shat on Twitter. I hope that you all understand the gravity of this situation. If my voice was fully with me, I would be trying to scare you much, much more, but not to sell fear. It's the fact that we have data that represents this. So I'd like to thank everybody from F5 Networks as well as Lorica and interns that actually helped contribute to this body of work. And also I'd like to be able to take any questions if anybody has anyone, has any. Thank you. I don't even know how much time I've left. Early. Okay. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, there's a wrap room. Oh, no, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. We have a, I, do I have five minutes? I mean, you have time. Okay. But they want to answer the now. Hey, man, that's a record for you. Okay. Did the highway patrol fix their stuff? <laughs> Did the California Highway Patrol fix their stuff? Um, I know the CHP has had a number of pin tests since uh, 2016. Um, you know, I didn't break down whether or not the CHP had devices in the scan list. It's also probably not a good idea to specifically call out which ones are always still vulnerable, but uh, I would be surprised if they did. Let's just, I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, but no, I haven't checked, honestly, to be able to give you a definitive answer. I wish I could. It's a good question. Please. Have you had any success on detecting uh, CRS wireless um, cards through an APN as opposed to some of the other methods that you were using? Through APM, not as much. We did identify a lot of devices from some visibility into traffic that we can see that's on 1919 space. And so there's far more devices. It's just what's available publicly and what essentially is not. Uh, additionally, we ruled, we ended up, we were reporting closer to 600,000 devices initially, but we were covering a larger swath. We were essentially including all of their OEM chips that they were releasing out to partners like Dell and Cradlepoint uh, in theirs. And we're not saying that those are not vulnerable or that they are vulnerable, but I, as far as the APM, we didn't, we didn't actually measure it uh, outside of it. Okay. So, so these were just regular cell devices with publicly available IP addresses. Yeah. There's, so essentially when you, 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 know, you, you buy the device and you get the data plan, you end up getting a static address, say from Verizon, they give you a static IPv4 address that's in there. And it's really important to companies like Verizon and AT&T because it just starts to eat at their spectrum. Right? It's a very real problem for cellular providers. It's not necessarily eating at bandwidth and stealing bandwidth and you know, too many packets. They have this whole spectrum of their communication, and this is just essentially tens of thousands of devices that are pulling away from that, eating into it. But I can, I can try to maybe run some queries and give you a, an answer. Yeah, that would be you wanna, Yeah, you can hit me up. I'll, yeah, I will do that. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Please. Uh, good morning. Is this problem the same on Verizon wireless devices? Uh, you mean like Verizon MiFi's? Uh, the ones that um, electric utilities use out on the field, uh, cellular gateways. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of the devices that are in use, the if it's using a Sierra wireless chip, uh, there's some probability. 
but we're speaking to the like this five or six models that we included in it. They're actually the, I mean, if you remember the image, they're the full gateways. They're much larger than like the air cards. But I know from a former experience, we used them in pumps and essentially in like the control equipment for all the ICS and SCADA data was for all their SCADA systems that went for these pumps that we were operating and they were used there. And so I'd be surprised if they weren't. But I don't know specifically if Verizon's branded, Verizon specific modems, their cellular gateways are included in this. Uh, we didn't look for any Verizon equipment specifically. We just and you mentioned um, on one of your slides that uh, using a VPN tunnel mm -hmm. uh, helps, but I mean, you also need to turn off the uh, GPS disclosure, right? Right. Those features like the publicly displayed GPS, the latitude, longitude, cell information, it's very, it's important to know none of that's on by default. We found tens of thousands of devices that turned that on optionally, intentionally. It's not a default configuration, but yeah, I would, I would, I would not enable that unless you have a really good reason. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Hi. Hi. Um, for some of these um, organizations, like the um, Highway Patrol, do um, doesn't it make sense for them to be able to track where their cars are at, like, or individuals are at any end? like given point for safety reasons? Absolutely. I mean, there's also other safety precautions. But. It's, no, it's a great question. It's absolutely essential for dispatchers and other police officers to know where their fellow colleagues are. I mean, they're, you know, police brethren, um, and, you know, we're brothers and sisters in the fraternal order of police. They want to know where all these people are. I'm not supposed to know where they are. Exactly. You are not supposed to know where they are. Somebody in Africa is not supposed to know where they are. And it's not just know where they are, it's know where they are every moment of every day, 24 hours a day, and very, very, very specifically. So it's uh, at least to the seventh, I believe, um, digit or int in GPS, so one more is down, I don't know what, what we get down to, but it's much more specific if we add one more digit. But any other questions? Wouldn't you say that, um, wouldn't you say that probably every radio has this problem? And why do radios in general have web servers in them? And why don't you push to make it so you configure all radios with SSH instead of web servers? One, I do not work for Sierra Wireless. <laughs> um, I have been working very closely with them. It's been really, really wonderful. I'll bring it up. Why do this? Actually, I do know that the web configuration screen, and I apologize for not bringing this up in the talk, it's in much more other subsequent material that we publish, the web configuration GUI really shouldn't be publicly available in any way. The config GUI you see where you log in and you get the status page, you get the information about everything that's happening with the device, that's not supposed to necessarily be public. It was. It wasn't until very recently. So if you email security at crwireless.com, if you have one of these devices, they'll actually help you move on if you've been infected to their cloud platform, and that takes away that interface. The problem is they've been offering that for quite some time, years, and people have not started, you know, not everyone's picked up on it yet. And so to the question as to why they have interfaces in them to begin with is for just to make it intuitive for administrators to be able to configure these devices. I mean, uh, I really doubt that the same guys configuring Arista switches and, you know, Juniper MX 240s are out configuring CR wireless devices in the field, so they need to make it easy. It also helps to have a templated configuration with a very easy upload kind of idea that, people can get to them. So, if I, I hope that I fully, that I grab all your questions? Wonderful. Um, I had a quick question. The, uh, of course, it has a web interface. What about a CLI interface? Command there, line interface? There is a CLI interface. So it's just as accessible as a web interface and probably got a little more uh, breadth to it. Yeah, so you have, essentially, you could tell that into the device, the default port was 2332. I uh, used to advertise a banner, it would help us identify it, but once you were in, you could issue essentially commands to send text messages and do various other things. I had a slide, if you guys wanna, it's, I can't zoom into it, but essentially on the status screen, they'll have like an AT command to the left of all of the features within the interface that you can use via Telnet or SSH or the command line. But the command line, once they fix the firmware uh, uploader, and you can no longer, it was no longer insecure, and you could arbitrarily run code, uh, that should have gone away. Yeah. Hey, Justin. What's uh, up, man? My question is more when you went to to the vendor there. Uh, when you report something like this to a vendor, they always say thanks, but it can be thanks or it can be thanks, right? 
Um, or it can be, thank you, we're going to play the quiet game and see yes. who can win. And, and I'm, I'm curious to know how they responded, because uh, in my experience, it has a lot to do with kind of the uh, viewpoints of the management and how serious they actually saw this or how much uh, convincing and uh, security Bible thumping did you have to do? I didn't go thumping. Um, I, I firmly believe the problem scope and the evidence that was sent with the disclosures would speak to the problem enough. Um, for example, hypothetically, if you were to raise and lower a bridge and send it to somebody in that city, you would, you would believe they'd find it very important because you should not be able to raise and lower bridges. Um, I'm not saying it happens, I'm just saying it could. Now, we sent out standard disclosures. The problem is we're kind of one step removed. We couldn't identify every organization because so many were associated with like one slash nine within this company leasing out to Verizon. And so it got really complicated. It's actually a process that needs to be improved. It's one of the biggest problems we have, or one of the biggest problems I think many of us have, but especially with this case. So many of these companies were oblivious that they even had the devices and it came down to we had to prove it. And then once we tried to prove it, it just essentially fizzled out because whoever we were trying to essentially approve it to, it never really went anywhere. And so when I say zero up until 2018, I really mean it. We had, we had one essentially try to respond, but somehow instead of responding to us, they responded to like somebody four steps away from us. And so it never even made it back. They just, I guess, Googled some stuff and thought that that's who they should respond to. So what's that, man? Hi, thanks for the talk. I have two questions. Uh, you mentioned that VPN as a, a mitigation uh, plan. Uh, do any of these devices have built-in VPN capabilities, or w does this mean that you have to install something else that does your VPN tunneling for you? All of them support VPN tunnels. They support a, a variety of VPN tunnel types as well, like IPsec. Um, Okay, so it's just a matter yeah. of using it, using the functionality. Right, they're not using it. Uh, and you mentioned uh, that they now have some cloud-based management uh, thing. Instead yeah, I believe it's called like AVMS. Okay. So yeah. it's, it essentially is their unified platform. Is this something that Sierra hosts or does the client need to host its own? Sierra hosts it, I believe. Okay. Does this create like a single point of failure? Can it be DDoSed and then it prevents everyone from managing their stuff? Honestly, I can only surmise or maybe state some assumptions, but I don't have any specific answers to how it works. I, uh, I actually asked for a preview of it myself, so I'm hoping to get one in the next couple of weeks. But uh, being that we didn't really start to get attention until July 28th, and today it's August 9th, I haven't had exactly a lot of time to fit in more work with Sierra. But yeah, hit me up on Twitter, man. As soon as I know, I can share it with you. I'd be happy to. Sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. First, I would like to comment on configuration management of a bunch of radios, right? If, if I'm, let's say I work for a utility or muni, I buy the radios, I own them. Who manages the radios? Do you buy ADMS to manage the radios? Do you count on Sierra managing it for you, or are you going to do it yourself? Is it a question of the speaker? Right. Oh, okay, it's, sorry. But uh, that's, no, okay. It's a but, good question. It's who's responsible for these devices. I'm a municipality. I have a police force of 800 officers. Yeah. We have 800, you know, police cruisers, 200 support staff, who knows however many right. SWAT vans and paddy wagons. But, but if they do a deal with Sierra to manage it, then, you know, then is it a single point of failure? You have to have that discussion, I, uh, you know. I would, and I would have that, I would definitely yeah. encourage you to have that discussion with them. It's a very important, yeah. you know, requirement of whatever your deployment's going to be. I agree. Um, I can't imagine Sierra being, I, I do want to remind everyone, this is not a hardware defect or a software defect in Sierra. They did not build a crap product. They didn't build something that's just awful, right? It's just as much a user configuration problem as it is our industry's problem as a Sierra problem. Yeah. And so I would, I'm sure there's other options. There's actually lots of fleet management options. There's even open source. Yeah. So you have, there's a variety of. Okay, so just the, the last question would be, so again, let's say I'm a muni, I've got 800 officers. Why is this network not on Verizon private? Are these publicly exposed IP addresses? Yes, they're publicly but, but exposed. Why would, I, why would I do that? Go ask them. <laughs> this is exactly what we need to be talking about. Why? Okay. Why are we on public IP addresses? Why are we not using VPNs? Verizon, help us. Why are we doing this? And, her, and on Verizon side, just, just say, like, Spectrum. Bring up the word Spectrum, apparently. I, don't, I just learned this, but... If anybody in here is Verizon, Spectrum, I'm using the word that's supposed to get attention. So 
we want to help. We're the good guys and we're here to help. Yeah. And it's just finding people who are as interested as you are and like, hey, I want to help. I have a, I'm a muni. I have this problem. Let's do something about it. So I appreciate the question. Yeah, okay. If you have any more, I'd be happy to uh, answer in the wrap-up room. I think we're out of time. Oh. You guys want five minutes of your life back or you got more questions? I'm happy to keep going.